Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. For this podcast, I will give a brief update on the status of the Serious Keto channel. I'll give my review of the book The Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung. I'll respond to a couple of common questions that I get, or I guess we could call them frequently asked questions, or sometimes they're stated more as a comment down in the comments. Regardless, I'll give my response to those. And if at any point during this podcast I refer to our current situation, I'm kind of talking about that whole stay-at-home quarantine thing. So first off, two things related to the channel, and I've discussed this in at least one of my previous podcasts, which is that a number of you have not been receiving notifications when I publish new videos. And some of you found that when you went into notifications that all was no longer selected. It was, um, I forget what the other one option is, that basically YouTube kind of decides what you're going to see and what you're not going to see. I've had other people say, well, I had all selected, but I still haven't seen a video from you show up in my recommended list in two months. So I've had a couple people tell me that when they unsubscribed and then resubscribed, they started getting notifications again. There have been some sort of odd things going on with YouTube lately, and I'm not sure if it's on purpose or by accident, but I've seen comments disappear, comments that I have made down in the comment section, replies that I've given to people. I have gone and refreshed the screen and they disappear. And, you know, these are completely benign comments, nothing inflammatory, no spam, no trigger words or, or anything like that. They, just the comments aren't sticking. I've also received comments, I've seen them from other people and then gone back into the comments section later and their comments are gone. So, I'm not entirely sure what's going on. I hope it's just something buggy, something glitchy going on with YouTube these days. So if you do see that you post a comment and then it's not there, it's not me deleting it. There's just something weird going on. In other channel news, we have finally hit the point in Wisconsin where I believe it is finally safe to get my vegetable garden going without fear of frost. Knock on wood. We had one frost, oh gosh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago that came on Memorial Day weekend and completely wiped out every tomato and pepper plant that I had. But I'm hoping we're past that. What does this mean for you? It means that I could have a slightly more erratic video shooting schedule. You know, it's kind of the whole, you got to make hay while the sun is shining sort of deal. So when the weather's nice, I'm going to be outside working the garden rather than inside filming. You're also probably going to see more recipes with fresh herbs and fresh vegetables as the season moves on. The other thing you will notice is that my hands take an absolute beating over the course of the summer. Between yard work and gardening and stuff, I'm not a real wear gloves sort of guy, especially when I'm working in the soil. I just, I like that nature feel of getting my fingers down into the dirt. As a result, I mean, my nails take a beating, my hands take a beating. I need to keep my nails fairly short just to try and keep them clean. But I, I foresee getting comments from people saying, Dude, what happened to your hands? They they're just they totally look beat up. Yeah, that's going to happen over the course of the summer. Just so you know, I don't want it to be a distraction. So I think that's it from the standpoint of the Serious Keto channel. Let's now talk about The Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung. I got this book on Audible, and it's taken me quite a while to listen to it because usually I listen to audiobooks either when I'm out walking, which... I need the weather to be like above 45 degrees for me to kind of enjoy going out for a walk. That's Fahrenheit. And we've only finally gotten to that point here in Wisconsin. Or I do it when I'm driving. But with this whole stay at home current situation, I'm doing almost no driving. In fact, I think I'm I'm still on the same tank of gas from March. I might need to put some fuel stabilizer in my car. So it's taken me a little bit of time to make it through this book. And I enjoyed it so much on Audible that I purchased it on my Kindle as well because it's something that I'm going to want to be able to refer to and do searches on because it has such an incredible wealth of information. I try not to tell other people that they absolutely ought to read some particular book. When people do that to me, it kind of feels like they're giving me homework. Like, hey, you should totally read this. What I really hate is when someone hands you a book, like you didn't even ask for it. They're just like, here, take this book, read this. You know, for me, I kind of then feel obligated to read it. So as a result, I tend not to push books on other people. But I want to push the obesity code on you. I think if you 
are a person who's trying to lose weight, if you are a person who has any interest in the physiology of what happens once you put food into your body, this book is a must read. It is written, I think, at pretty much the perfect level. It doesn't talk down to you and it doesn't overcomplicate things. It uses a lot of metaphor, which I love. I think metaphor is a great way to convey a message and to teach. I think also that for those people who are sort of self-anointed diet and nutrition subject matter experts, whether that be vegan or standard American diet or keto or paleo or carnivore or whatever, if you're the sort of person that likes leaving comments that say, oh, that'll totally spike your insulin, or oh, that's horrible for your liver, or you don't need that much fat, or that's too many carbohydrates, or you shouldn't eat this, or you should eat more of that. If you are one of those people, I strongly recommend you read this book before you post your next comment. Because I think you're gonna find that a lot of things you believe will be challenged by this book no matter where you are sort of parked along the diet and nutrition spectrum, there will likely be something in this book that challenges your beliefs, or maybe you just don't wanna hear. If you're dirty keto and you read this, it's gonna tell you that there are some things that you're eating that you shouldn't eat. And you're gonna to have to make that decision. You know, do I wanna be dirty keto? Do I not wanna be dirty keto? If you are really dogmatic clean keto, you're gonna find that he says some things that challenges that as well. I think if you're dogmatic about any type of diet or nutrition, this book is gonna challenge you. And I think that's a good thing. So aside from challenging some of your beliefs, it is an amazing book at explaining just the whole physiology of insulin response, why diets work, why diets fail, there's a great deal of background and history on this, on how obesity became the epidemic that it is today. And the book explores so many different myths. All of the things you hear, especially from your standard American diet friends about calories in, calories out, a calorie is a calorie, eat less, move more, fat is bad, fat is good, protein is bad, protein is good, carbohydrates are bad, carbohydrates are good. He really addresses all of these things. He talks about big food, and he talks about the impact of poverty on obesity. He talks about how we got to the place where we're at with childhood obesity as well. So it's a fascinating book in terms of the history and how we got to where we got, on the physiology of eating and our body's response. It does feel like it takes a while to sort of get to the solution. I mean, as I look through the contents list here, we've got 20 chapters. The first 18 are really just the whole buildup, the explanation. And it's not until you get to chapters 19, what to eat, and chapter 20, when to eat, that you kind of get the answer. And I, I felt as I was going through this book, I'm like, just when, when are you gonna get to the answer? I feel like you're kind of taking me on a long journey here. It's a worthwhile journey, and honestly, I think Chapter 20, just on fasting, makes the book worth its price. It's that good. Ultimately, I think you will find that if you are in any sort of a low-carb lifestyle, that you're gonna probably agree with 90% or more of this book. And you're gonna find that it will allow you to speak more effectively and intelligently to people that are perhaps not low-carb or that are telling you that what you're doing is a horrible thing. Like I said, I enjoyed it so much in the audiobook that I wanted to have a physical or electronic, you know, Kindle copy so that I could refer to it from time to time. Regarding the Audible book, the narrator has a very good voice. He's got a good storytelling voice. He uses uh, the appropriate animation in his voice as he's talking. From that standpoint, very good. However, Either he mispronounces a number of different words, or I've been mispronouncing them my entire life. For example, what I pronounce as monounsaturated fat, he pronounces as monounsaturated fat. I thought mono was like meant one. I don't know. Maybe he's right and I'm wrong. What else? Oh, glycogen. I thought it was glycogen. 
unless there's another word like glycogen. Or maybe there's two pronunciations. Maybe it's like in the United States, we pronounce it aluminum and everybody else pronounces it aluminum. So I don't know, glycogen, glycogen. Quinoa, the ancient grain. I almost said that like it was a slogan, quinoa, the ancient grain. He pronounces it, I believe, quinoa, which I also don't think is correct. And there's some other mispronunciations or different than Steve pronunciations. I'm not saying I'm the end all be all when it comes to knowing how to pronounce words. Clearly I'm not. But whenever I hit one of those, it kind of, it felt like a little bit of a speed bump to me. So just be aware of that. Also, if you do get the Audible book, make sure you go in and you download the associated PDF because any of the graphs or charts or anything like that that is referred to in the book is contained in that PDF. Anyhow, fantastic book. I love it. I will link to it down in the description. Great book. And I think I may in the future, if I get some sort of know-it-all comment on something like, oh, that's going to spike your insulin or that does this or that does that, that runs in the face of what Dr. Fung said, I may just copy and paste the link to the book as my response. One of the other things that I think I'll start doing in these podcasts is either responding to frequent comments that I get that are similar and or questions that I get. And lots of times there's overlap. You know, sometimes people phrase it as a comment, sometimes people phrase it as a question. And, you know, I'll cover a couple of those on every one of these podcasts. The first one I'm going to cover is, do you color your hair? No, I do not. But I have noticed, as you have probably noticed as well, that on video and in in photographs as well, that my hair sometimes looks very gray and sometimes it looks pretty dark. And it really comes down to three things. One, how long it is. Two, am I using any sort of hair product to kind of, you know, keep it under control or give it some texture. But the biggest thing is the lighting. I think, you know, when I'm down here in the Sirius Keto Man Cave, it looks a little bit more, I think, lighter brown. When I'm up in the kitchen, very often it looks darker. And if you watched the Perfect Keto promo video that I did yesterday, it'll only be up for two days and then I'll delete that. I'm outside and in sunlight, all of the silver or gray hair just becomes completely reflective. And I look totally gray when I'm out in the sunshine. So it's really mostly lighting and then partially hair length and hair product. That's it. No artificial coloring or flavoring. Next, I get comments or questions on the whole keto snack food thing, whether this is prepackaged stuff or making your own. And the comments slash questions on that sort of range the whole gamut. I get some sort of mean comments from the more dogmatic keto, clean keto folks, the ones that say that using these artificial sweeteners or creating these fat bombs or candy bars or snack items really is just like a gateway drug. You're just gonna lead people right back into their old eating habits. They need to purge themselves of all sweets and munchies and snacks and all of this stuff. I get other people on the other end that kind of ask. They're like, don't you, aren't you afraid that by having these snacks you're gonna overeat and somehow you know go back to your old way of eating? And my answer to that, at least for me, is no. I kind of need these things. And I need them because I live in a house where I'm outnumbered four to one by non-keto people. And these particular non-keto people that make up my family like snacks. They like carby foods and lots of junk food. There is never a shortage of cookies or donuts or crackers or chips or other snack foods in the house. And from time to time, when you get that sort of snack attack thing going on, that moment of weakness where you just, you need to have something right now, if I didn't have fat bombs or keto candy bars or keto crackers, that chocolate covered mini donut, oh man, I could could just eat one. That would probably be okay, right? Well, now that I've had one, I'm kind of obligated to keep eating. I'm going to have a cookie, too. You know, I often describe, like, the perfect keto bars or cookies or things like that as, in case of emergency, break glass. These are the things that save me. Now, ideally, I'd prefer to have my own keto candy bars. And sometimes I've got keto candy bars and 
keto fat bombs and things like that ready to go, but sometimes I don't. And when I don't, then I reach for something prepackaged. But to give you an idea of how seldom I actually eat something like a perfect keto bar, I'm still working my way through what I purchased on Black Friday. So I don't hit that stuff real hard. I tend to have it there for emergencies, but when the emergency strikes, I like to have it. That's why I make these things. Plus to me, keto is a lifestyle. And if it starts feeling not like a lifestyle to me, but instead feeling like a diet, I don't see myself sticking with it because I've never stuck with any diet previously. Keto is the longest thing I've ever done. And I've been doing it now for like 15 months, something like that, and don't see an end in sight because I feel that I approach it sensibly. I'm willing to allow myself a little bit of dirt on my keto. I'm willing to eat keto-friendly snacks and I don't feel obligated to be super duper militant in my execution of keto. So I guess that's the long answer. The short answer is no, I think that keto snacks are a good thing to have around, but like anything, you shouldn't abuse them because they're still calories. And even though they're relatively low in carbs, the net carbs will add up if you decide to just binge. And finally, as with all of my podcasts lately, I'm gonna end kind of talking about this whole stay at home quarantine thing again. Frankly, I'm starting to get a little bit tired of it. Getting a little bit old. I've mentioned before that um, as someone who's not an ideal rule follower, that this whole structure when you're out in public and shopping is a little bit more than I like. The other thing that I'd heard about and am starting to experience myself is the quarantine 15. So people putting on weight while we're doing this stay at home thing. Now, interestingly, I've gone up about 10 pounds since March. I have not altered my diet at all. I've been in ketosis the entire time. But, and this loops back to the obesity code, I'm sleeping not well. I feel kind of stressed, honestly, and um, it's affecting my sleep. And I'm sure what I'm doing is I'm producing more cortisol. And in the obesity code, at the very, very end, Dr. Fung talks about that as a cause for weight gain. It's unfortunate that he goes like 19 chapters before he... Actually, you know what? I think he gets all the way to an appendix before he talks about trying to de-stress and eliminate cortisol. So de-stressing through meditation, what he calls um, sleep hygiene, so getting cleaner, better sleep. I would have liked to have seen him be able to focus a lot more on that rather than have that just be tacked on right at the end because I think that's what I'm dealing with right now. I think incredibly poor sleep and then I'm just, I'm in not such a great mood during the day and just the, the stress of when I do go out and go shopping and, you know, see this surreal situation that, that we're in now. I think that's starting to kind of affect me a little bit psychologically and I'm probably producing more cortisol and that's then resulting in some additional pounds. That's my hypothesis. I'm going to test that. I'm going to start really following Dr. Fung's advice and improve my sleep conditions and start meditating daily. And I'll let you know how that works out. The one cool thing about this whole quarantine 15 is maybe it'll be like the New Year's Day sort of thing where everybody you know, once quarantine is lifted, people are like, holy cow, I put on, you know, 15 pounds during the holidays or I put on 15 pounds during quarantine. Time to start looking at some healthier alternatives and maybe that'll drive some people towards keto. And if you've read the obesity code, then you can give them some coaching on a low carb lifestyle. I always try and find at least one positive or upbeat thing about our current situation. And it occurred to me well, actually, two things occurred to me when I was out shopping for a light fixture the other day. One, I think people are going to get a lot better at projecting their voice as a result of all of this because we're having to learn to speak through masks and plexiglass and things like that. So hopefully people start becoming better speakers, being able to more clearly enunciate words, etc. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too optimistic there. But here's one. There has probably never been a better time in history to be a ventriloquist. See, put this on. You can't even tell that my lips are moving, can you? Okay, that was a bad idea.
So that's going to be it for this podcast. Next week, I hope to do another review. I'm also going to ask for your help for something. So I want you to think about it over the course of the next week because I'm going to ask you about it next podcast. Is what are some of the more unexpected side effects that you've experienced since going keto? For example, one of the things that used to be with me is um, my wedding band was like welded into my hand 70 pounds ago. And now I find there are times that it's almost so loose that it just slides right off. I may need to get it resized. So sort of strange side effects like that or health things, things that maybe you kind of took for granted and didn't realize. We've talked before about seasonal allergies, asthma. I've had people tell me that their eczema has gone away. People tell me that dandruff has gone away. I'm looking for things like that. Not just the weight loss and blood pressure medication or acid reflux medication, but some of the more interesting, call it quality of life sort of benefits that you've seen from keto. So give that some thought so that I can ask you about it during the next podcast. And thanks for watching or listening.